How many times have you walked into a room or a networking event or a stage to give a big presentation and you're terrified about what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to do? How can I show that I'm calm and confident and assertive and powerful? And you're certainly not going to do that if you get nervous and you crunch into a ball and you go like this and you don't use the proper body language. So today I am extremely excited to share with you an interview that we recently did with body language expert Mark Bowden, who's going to give you the one simple secret to make sure that when you are on stage, when you are talking to that person, when you're negotiating your salary, that you are doing this one thing to make sure that you are seen as calm, confident, competent, and in charge of the situation. You want to find out what it is? Then stay tuned. We had an awesome interview. We talked about all different types of things. If you are ready to master your body language and discover the mistakes and the things that you should be doing to make sure that you are always seen as the man or woman in charge, then stay tuned because we had an awesome interview and I'm going to share it with you right now. Hello, hello everyone. Today I am extremely excited because we have an incredible guest with us, Mr. Mark Bowden. He is a body language and communications extraordinaire, and Mark has trained the political and Hollywood elite, CEOs and royalty, and did one of my absolute favorite TED Talks of all time on why we should all be a bit more inauthentic. He's the author of three wonderful books, Winning Body Language, the follow-up, Winning Body Language for Sales Professionals, How to Control the Conversation, Command Attention, and Convey the Right Message Without Ever Saying a Word, which are three things everyone should want to be able to do, and his newest book, Tame the Primitive Brain, 28 Ways in 28 Days to Tame the Most Impulsive Behaviors at Work. Mark was voted number one in the world's top 30 body language professionals for two years running, and we are extremely grateful that he has taken some time out of his very busy schedule to be with us here today. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, and uh, I hope I'll be of use to everybody there. So uh, fire away with your questions. Now, before the interview, I did some research, and I saw on your Facebook that you have been traveling all over the world recently doing speaking and training people and I just wondered how long have you been training professionals and doing public speaking appearances? Yeah, so I've been doing this, I think, for almost a decade, almost 10 years now. Uh, as you say, traveling all over the world, I spend a lot of time in airports, a lot of time just for moments in a country and then getting back on a plane and trying to get to the next place or back here to my family. So uh, it's a pretty busy time, but it's great to get the chance to go out, meet a lot of different audiences and try and help people as much as I can uh, stand out, win trust, gain credibility when they're speaking just like me. So I, I try and emulate and use, well, I always use the techniques that I, I want them to learn in order for them to stand out and win trust and gain credibility, whatever conversation they're having, be it at home or work. What got you interested and started in the study of body language and nonverbal communication? So originally I was just fascinated by life out there on the planet and uh, especially sea creatures i was a bit as a kid i was a big rock pooler used to like it to get in there and look at crabs and and you know jellyfish and anything i could get my hands on really and then i got fascinated with human behavior uh, i used to think to myself well why did they do that why did i end up doing that why why don't we have a good relationship or or uh, you know why do we have a great relationship i was just interested in in the behavior that went into life going on and getting on well with life or getting on badly with life. So I started to explore that whole area. When it comes to learning body language, it's incredible how much you can learn about others simply by being observant and watching their body language and their nonverbal cues. But so many people go through their day-to-day -day lives and they just don't pay attention. They aren't observant to what's actually going on out there. Well, I think you're right, you're right there, actually, if I just jump in there, because it's really important what you say there about some people aren't observant. And there's no reason why you should be, because you can really get on fine in life without being very observant. You won't 
die, you'll carry on and you'll do okay, depending on, you know, where you're born and who you're born to, you'll probably do pretty much okay. It's only really when you start thinking, well, I want a little bit more or I'm not quite where I want to be at the moment. At that point, it's usually that you're not being so observant about what you're doing, what other people are doing and the reactions that are happening around you. So, th so thanks for mentioning that. Now, you train thousands of students per year through your speaking engagements and trainings, as well as all of your online courses. So what would you say to someone who, who knows absolutely nothing about body language? Where should they really start? Yeah, so uh, first of all, body language tip number one is think about your body language more than you think about anybody else's. And I, I say that in terms of um, stop reading, start leading. So stop uh, actually what we, what we talked about, which is stop observing the body language out there and start observing your own body language. So become interested in your own behavior. And then the second part of that would be very simple is start observing when you think you're being open with your body language and start observing when you think you're being closed with your body language. Open and closed is very easy to, to see. Um, imagine uh, you're warming yourself at a fire. You know, you're cold and there's a fire in front of you and you're warming yourself. And think about how much you'd open up your body to receive that warmth. And, and that would be open body language. Whatever you think you might do around a fire to open up and receive the warmth. Yeah, start doing that as open body language. Now, think about um, you're out, there's no fire and you're cold and you want to warm yourself. Yeah, but now you're having to use closed body language to do that. Think of all the stuff you've got to do to keep yourself warm when there's no fire. That's kind of closed body language. So uh, pay attention to your own body language rather than anybody else's and start to perform on purpose the behaviors of open body language. If you do that alone, in fact, if you, I'm not saying you should stop listening right now, but actually, if you just stopped listening right now and went out and did that, you know, as much as you can, as many times a second as you can for the rest of your life, you would see a profound difference in the way people respond to you. You'd see a profound change to the positive. So just two tips there. And, you know, if you switch off now and start doing that, you'll do very well. Many of our students understand the theory and they like to learn about body language, but they never actually pay attention to their own body language and what they are exuding in terms of their nonverbal cues and they get so wrapped up in their own head that they don't actually think about what they are projecting. Yeah, yeah, so here's what'll get you wrapped up in your own head. If you start going down the route of trying to decode other people's body language, if you start doing that reading aspect. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do body language reading. It's a really interesting area, and if you like reading about stuff, if you like getting into fine detail, if you like critical thinking, if you like to explore different possibilities and different avenues of what something could mean, if you like things like crossword puzzles, if you like thing, you know, if you like, if you like kind of discovery games, then, uh, you know, or, or long, long dramas, it'll be great for you. Uh, but you could well get very, very wrapped up in it and never really make any better contact with anybody. You might walk around going, oh, I think I'm pretty intelligent and I think I know about you and I think I can read you like a book. And you might be right, maybe you, you but that's not going to make people like you. Nobody ever liked anybody who went, I, I know what you're thinking right now. They just thought they were being a bit of a smart, you know, smart aleck and, and, and it will lower their status. So, of course, so, so explore the world of behavior as much as you like. But if you're one of those introverted people who also likes to get into a lot of fine data, get into the data about your own performance rather than the data about other people. Read about your behavior that you can send out rather than reading about the behavior of, of 
other people because that will help you make better contact with other people and it's about making those good strong relationships that's the key hope that makes sense now that is some phenomenal advice now i'd like to take a second and talk about your ted talk on why and how we should all be a bit more inauthentic when it comes to creating a favorable first impression yeah. with someone new yeah, yeah. So we often assume that, and we'd be quite right, that there are kind of two responses, the approach or avoid response to somebody else. And that's that's uh, pretty accurate. But within that, you've got some other subcategories that the primitive brain, your brain stem uses. It's a 500 million year old brain. It's very old and has simple what we call heuristics, way of making ways of making decisions based on the world that it sees around it and a very simple, let's call it an algorithm to make a decision. And it's got four categories it can put people into. So, uh, you know, as you're watching me now, as you as the audience, you're watching watching me now, I would say there are four categories that you can put me into. First category, in no real order, is you look at me and you look at my behavior and the tonality of my voice and you think, is Mark a friend to me? Will I benefit from him? If I spend time with him, will I come out with more than I went in with? Will I profit from being around him? And if you do that with me, a message is sent from that brainstem to the smart brain, the neocortex, saying, go and get me all the data that proves Mark is a friend. So you get what we call a cognitive bias. But the bias is based on my behavior. You're not bothered about what I'm saying. In fact, you'll adapt, you'll manipulate, you'll distort and delete and pick, cherry pick the good stuff, the friendly stuff that you're hearing from me to fit your bias. And if there is no friendly stuff, you'll just make it up. You'll just create an imaginative idea about me being friendly. Now, alternatively, another category is I start behaving in front of you and I trigger you with the idea that I am a threat. I am a predator. If you spend time with me, you will come out with less than you went in, in with. I'll take from you. Again, if I hit that, you get a cognitive bias and you only get the bad stuff from me. And if I'm actually telling you good stuff and I'm being a great person to be around, but essentially my body language has told you that I'm a threat, you'll make up a story about me being a threat, regardless of the great content, the great work, the great person I am to be around, you'll distort me into a bad person to be around. Now, third category is you see certain signals within me and it triggers an innate response for you to think, oh yeah, I I'm a potential sexual partner for you. I'm a potential mate for you. And there's lots of things that might hit that. Uh, we, we look at things like hair, uh, whether it's uh, shiny, whether it's strong in color, that denotes high mineral content, high omega-3s in the diet, means I come from a land where there's a good, rich food source. And if we're to mate, the offspring stand a good chance of, of that food source, okay? Now, you know, this that you see here, this just comes out of a bottle. So, uh, I, you know, I put this stuff on. And I only tell you that just so you can understand that we as human beings have been putting on signals for millennia to get people to feel the best about us, to think the best about us. It is natural, it is authentic for human beings to put on behaviors. Actually, it's very authentic for us to lie. Lying is one of our most important social skills. If you can't lie, and there are some people out there who don't have the ability to lie. It's not that they choose not to lie, okay? They don't have the ability because of some cognitive processes, some differences that they have. They find it very hard for other people to get on with them. Yeah, they have to be well supported by a community because... Lying is one of our most important social skills. In fact, some of the people out there who I've noticed try very, very hard to be very, very authentic with people, they're not that nice to be around <laughs> because, because they say stuff and they go, well, I'm just being authentic. Then you have to go, yeah, you're being nasty, actually. It's like, I don't, I don't want to go out with you. You're not very pleasant. Yeah, so, uh, so we put on behaviors in order to get along with other people. It's an important skill of ours. Last category, if I don't hit friend or enemy or sexual partner for you, you're just indifferent to me. Yeah, 
you, you've, in fact, if I didn't hit friend for you when I first came on here, you've already switched off. You're not here anymore. Yeah, you've gone. Yeah, those people that aren't watching this anymore, I didn't trigger for them enough of a sense of reward being around me and they're already gone. But I'm going to guess that most of you are still here. So, because <laughs> I'm doing some things on purpose in order to be able to uh, attract you to me and therefore for you to be positive around my content. Bit, bit of a long talk there, but I, but I hope that made sense, Brandon. Absolutely. That makes perfect sense. And it really ties into what we teach a lot of our students and that you don't have to change who you are. You just have to become a personality chameleon to adapt to the, the, to the specific situation. Absolutely. Yeah, you've got to decide how you think you best fit in and you've got to decide what you might want to perform, what behaviors of yours you might want to perform in order to best work socially. Uh, I would say, and this, this might be a little bit um, extreme for some people, uh, but I often think that this idea of authenticity is actually a little bit antisocial. This idea of, you know what, I, I should be able to be whoever I want to be, you know, I should be able to be me, yeah? And if people find it offensive, that's their problem, you know, because i got to be me. Well, no, that's just sometimes antisocial. That's, a, that's, in fact, there's levels of that that we just call it an antisocial disorder, to be honest. <laughs> so it's getting the right balance between you, the you that you really enjoy and you're comfortable with, and how does that fit in with the other, the others around? Because we human beings, uh, we are social mammals. We're not designed to be on our own. Yeah, the moment you're going, you know what, I'd like to spend a long, long time on my own. Well, that's, that's the start of an antisocial disorder. Yeah, that's definitely <laughs> not what we're going for. So if someone wants to really convey that they are confident and competent, it's really all about the use of open body language, more so than anything else. Yeah, so look, it's, it's, it's really simple, and I wish I could make it more difficult. <laughs> I wish I could make it more difficult so, so people wouldn't go, was that it? Is that, is that all? Like that? And I have to go, yeah. And, they, and they'll, go, they'll go, well, okay, but, but what else? And I go, nothing else. Just, just, just do this. Just do this. What, but, but what else should I? Nothing else. Just do this. Okay, here's what I want you to do is open body language, just open body language. And I'll be a little more specific. I would like you to do open body language at exactly navel height. I'm going to push back my chair a little bit so you can see this better when I'm sitting down, okay? So I'm being very open in the palms of my hands, yeah? And I'm being open at, at navel height as well. So that's different from being open at chest height. It's different from being open at at head height, and it's different from being open below my belt line, okay? It's open at navel height. I call this area of the body the truth plane, the horizontal gesture plane of truth, because when you gesture here openly, people feel that you are calm, assertive, open, honest, good to get along with. There's really no downside to this, especially if you're symmetrical. But all you need to think about is being open in this area here. You can do this standing or you can do this sitting, as I'm doing with you now. So it, it really is, you know, it really is that simple. I wish I could make it more difficult <laughs> for you. Right. It's actually just the act of doing it, especially when you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, so, so when interactions get more tricky for you, when you get stressed, when you're feeling that you don't quite fit in, when you're confused, when you're angry, upset, your body will authentically want to do other stuff. It'll want to be authentic and do closed body language. It will want to conceal. It will want to cover the feelings that you have rather than be exposed. And so that's what I talk about being inauthentic 
under stress and under pressure and when you're feeling that you're not fitting in, when you're feeling like people might be against you, when you're feeling that you might be in the wrong place, yeah, your authentic self will go, let's do fight or flight, let's cover up or let's get really aggressive around this and control this situation. Yeah, and it won't want to do calm, assertive body language. What you want to do is do that on purpose. Force yourself to do calm, assertive, open body language, open palm gestures at the truth plane. It's as simple as that. I love it. Just keeping it simple. No need to make it hard on yourself. It's just tapping into that primal part of the brain and forcing yourself to do to, to do the opposite and fight that initial impulse. Now, speaking of impulses, I'd like to take a second and ask sure. about your newest book, which I haven't had the chance to read yet. So if you could give us a little bit of an overview. Yeah, so so uh, what it's about is an understanding of neural architecture. So, it, so it's an understanding of how your brain is built and how our brains are built not nearly really at a at a, at a uh, very detailed level i look at the the structure of it because the form follows function the way it's structured is in order for it to function correctly in the outside world and with other people and if you know how it's structured then uh you don't necessarily need to fight it you can countermeasure it it's very hard to to fight your brain because it's 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 running it's running your whole body especially the brainstem, you can't really fight it. It's not, it's not designed to get fought. Uh, it keeps on running the same way for the whole of your life. What you can do is use your neocortex to countermeasure some of the uh, authentic responses that it has that actually are quite antisocial and they're designed to protect you and not your ability to work in a team. Yeah, there comes some stress points in your life when you start to find that your brain's going, oh yeah, I'm on my own here. I don't fit in. Uh, nobody understands me. Not even my family. Not even my best friends understand me anymore. That, that's because the brain stem has taken over the neocortex and the social mammalian brain, drawn blood from it, and decided it doesn't need it anymore because it's about the protection of the self. You start to act in a very selfish way way that's okay that's normal there's no problem with that we've all done that the key is is can you know that that's happening and can you countermeasure that response by being way less authentic and putting on behaviors that countermeasure it which are to the advantage of you and the group you want to be part of the organization you want to be a strong and leading aspect of so really, that's what the book is about. Tame the Primitive Brain, 28 Ways in 28 Days to Manage the Most Impulsive Behavior at Work. I will have to add that to my to-read list. It sounds absolutely fascinating. Now, one of the things that we work on with our students is being in the moment and staying present. And rather than focusing on the 15 different body language things that they can do or what questions to ask next, and just being present not what you should or shouldn't be doing at that exact time. Can you give some insight on this? Right, so, so you've put your finger on it, which is if there's 15 different things for us to think about, we're not going to be able to do it. And you won't be there in the moment. And you won't really be responding to the other person. They'll see you're not present. And they maybe will see you as being manipulative because they're seeing the cogs whirring <laughs> and they're seeing how unadept you are at it and they're, they're starting to see somebody who they don't think is social. So they think he's start, starting to become antisocial because they're thinking too hard about this. And so what if there were simple things that you could do that have what we call a cascade effect? So you do one thing and lots of other behaviours cascade out of that. And I wish I could make this more difficult, but <laughs> I've been doing this for a long, long time. <laughs> and, and what I've tried to do is get it down to some behaviors that will cascade other positive behaviors. And they're so easy to do, they will look absolutely natural to other people because they're so easy to do. 
And so a good one is open palm gestures at navel height. <laughs> In order to, for you to remain under stress and under pressure, calm and assertive, because it affects your own endocrine system. It affects the way you breathe. Your breathing will change if you gesture from here. Your breathing will change if you gesture from here. Your breathing will change if you gesture like this. Yeah, you'll get less oxygen, you'll get more blood, blood acidosis, the, the uh, hydrogen ions will go up in your blood, you'll get panicked even more if you start doing this because the vagus nerve will see the blood has gone acidic and it will start getting worried because it wants more oxygen, but it can't get more oxygen because you've closed your chest cavity. And so you start doing this sharp breathing as you're seeing in me now and people see that and they get worried about you because you've got a great idea for the organization and you really want that... Um, that uh, that step up in the organization but they can see how panicked you are and you're getting even more panicked by this but if you just do open palm gestures at navel height just see how much i seem to calm down and i can do this on purpose yeah all i'm doing is working these muscles there's only four muscles pretty much involved and those muscles talk to the other muscles not by some magic yeah, it's the fascia on the muscles. The, the outer coating of the muscles have nerve cells in that talk to the other muscles without the use of the brain stem or the, or the spinal column. Muscles know where other muscles are. It's, it's not magic, it's just biology. It's just the way we're, we're built. So back to it. Open palm gestures at navel height. Just do that. Exactly. See, sometimes we get wrapped up in everything and we're in study mode and we get in our own way and we end up handicapping ourselves when it comes to body language. Absolutely. Our, our innate responses, in some cases, can be handicapping. They can stop you getting what you want. The important thing is, is that you get what you want and what you need. Now, your brainstem sometimes has a very different idea about what you want and what you need. <laughs> yeah, your brainstem is only in it for you. It's not social. And so under stress and pressure, it will be antisocial. Nothing wrong with that. It keeps you alive on a daily basis. Yeah? Uh, it stopped you getting run over by cars again and again and again. It stopped you going down dark alleys again and again and again. But in a social situation where it's trying to work out a lot of difficult uh, calculations, it gets confused sometimes and it then takes over as if you're about to get run down by a bus. Yeah, so you have to stop it doing that. And the amazing thing about using open body language, especially the truth plane that you just discussed, is that you're never going to come off as aggressive or overly dominant. No, absolutely. It's calm and assertive. Uh, you know, when, when was there any ever a downside in being calm and assertive? When did anybody say, oh, I don't know, don't give them the job. They're just too calm and assertive. <laughs> was right. When did that ever happen? Yeah, no, don't bring them on the team. It's way too calm and assertive. Yeah? Yeah, don't hire him. He's just too calm and assertive. I love it. Now, outside of open body language, we work a lot with our students in terms of the importance of eye contact because it's something that's severely lacking in many conversations. And I think using the truth plane and focusing like that really makes eye contact a big part of it. Well, for sure, you'll find eye contact way more easy to do if you use the truth plane because it's calm and assertive, it's not aggressive, uh, and, it, and it's not worried. Um, so eye contact, all that means, that's, that's our, our targeting mechanism. It's the way of us showing each other or others what the target is. But it doesn't tell us what we think and feel about the target. The rest of the body does that. So I can get eye contact with you right now, but put in aggressive or angry body language and my eye contact won't feel very good for you or I can get eye contact with you and do a Duchenne smile and now it feels good. So you can see it's not about the eye contact. The eye contact just means you're the target. This is between me and you or it tells others this is between me and him or her out there. Yeah, me and them. 
Uh, but the rest of the face and the body especially is going to tell you how I'm thinking and feeling about our relationship. Without eye contact, there's not a good relationship. Then we need to know what is the nature of that relationship and the rest of the body does that. Thanks so much for that insight. Now, just a few more questions for you. If someone wanted to get in touch with you or find your books or read more about what you do, how can they do so? Yeah, sure. Uh, just go to my website. So that's www.truthplane.com. T-R-U-T-H-P-L-A-N-E. Truthplane.com. Go there. There's lots of video there. There's video training you can go to and get hold of. Lots of videos there to watch. You'll see information about my various books and so forth. Just just get on there, explore around, and and pick up any videos there that you think will be useful for you. Great. Just a few fun questions now to get everything wrapped up here. Who is an inspiration to you? Oh, yeah, lots of people. Uh, big inspirations. Um, Charles Darwin, uh, really important in the world of behavior. He, he is really the, you know, the, the grandfather of, of, uh, of human behavior and understanding its uh, evolutionary uh, background. So for evolutionary behavioral psychologists, it's a, it's, he's a really important guy. Uh, some other kind of strange, stranger people, uh, Robert Anton Wilson, look that guy up, Robert Anton Wilson. Uh, very interesting in terms of uh, thought processes, thinking differently, having a different view of the world and understanding that we make up the world in our head and if you could uh, understand how other people make up that world with you included in it, you'd be, be able to alter how you're seen, the perception that they have of you. So, you know, just to let you know, I am in your head right now. So, you know, obviously I exist in my world as well, but you're making me up in your head right now. What if there are ways that I could change the way you make up the picture and image of me? Essentially, I'd come across as a different person for you. So Robert Anton Wilson, look him up. I will definitely be looking him up and researching a bit more about him. Now, what would what is one book that you would give away or recommend to someone? Oh, so uh, Winning Body Language. First book that I that I wrote. Uh, it's a great all that we've talked about today. If you go to that book and it's available as an ebook as well with videos in it. So you know, go to your usual book monopolies like uh, Amazon, and and pick it up, pick it up there. Uh, but it's 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 really helpful in terms of what's the body language you need to do in order to create the impression that you need to have to get what you and your group need so that i give that away loads all right another oddball question here if you could have a conversation with anyone in the past or the present who would it be god you know I, here's what interests me is 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 the conversations that you have now so, so you know, if, if I could have any conversation, I'd be having the one that we're having now with you and with the audience out there because that's going to have the most immediate impact on other people. Uh, you know, the people in the past, like, you know, would I want to go and speak to Charles Darwin? No, not so much. Um, I don't know whether he'd be very good at conversation for a start. Uh, he's written some great books and he did some amazing stuff. And so I'm happy to read that. But in, from people in the past, I'm not actually interested in talking with them. I'm actually more interested in talking with people now, this conversation, because actually that's more important than what happened in the past. Doesn't really answer your question there. Um, but I think that may be one of my favorite answers of all time. And it comes back to what we said, be but said before about staying and being present in the moment and engaging in the now. Right. Well, there's a lot of risk to this. There's a lot of risk to this. You know, we're doing this live. We're not going to go back and re-record it. So what I say is what I say, and what you say is what, what you say, and it's really happening now. And if we get on, we get on, and if we don't, we don't. And so there's a lot of risk uh, around that. Um, you know, I, I think what you have to have is just some techniques to countermeasure some of that risk. All right. One last question. Is there any question that you wish that I had asked? 
No, <laughs> no, because <laughs> no, uh, because you've got out all the important questions. I think that that other people are. Um, interested in. Now, of course, I mean, there might be things that I think, ah, oh, you know, why don't we get really in depth into this? Why don't we get into, into the world that I'm kind of uh, detailed, fascinated on a daily basis? But that's not helpful. That's not helpful to, to you. And actually, it's not helpful to me. You know, what we've done is talk about the biggest, most impactful things, rather than the details that that the only kind of specialists would want to get involved in. And, you know, you don't need to be a specialist in body language. Everybody out there doesn't need to be a specialist. I just need to be a specialist because I need to give you what you what you need to pay attention to rather than all the peripheral specialist stuff. I need to, you know, take away, you, you know, until there's there's something which has a heart and of and and some power and some value to it. So there's nothing that I that you should have asked me that you didn't. Well, that is great. Thank you so very much for being here today, for taking the time out of your schedule. You have given some incredible advice and insight. I've learned some things. I know my viewers and our students have learned some things, and we really, truly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here with us. Well, I'm happy to come and uh, chat to you and your, uh, your audience any, any time. Um, so, so, you know, welcome me back at some time, and I'll, and I'll sit right here and do the same again. Thanks again. We'll chat soon. Thank you, and thank you all. And that's a wrap. What did you think? Did you learn something cool about body language? Mark's a pretty incredible guy. Like he said, check out his books. Check out truthplane.com for more information on what he's doing. He has one of my favorite TED Talks on why we should all be a little bit more inauthentic. You'll find links for all of that in the description below. As always, click subscribe right down there in the corner so that you never miss a video. And if you're ready to unleash your inner awesome, then make sure that you stay tuned. Check us out on the web, www.lifesecretsauce.com. Until next time, ciao for now.